today we'll continue with the some you know I'll, I'll have a little bit all that between the lectures so, so we can have continuity. Basically, we, I want to go back to the different media compression techniques. H H two six one two six three, uh, and then look at MPEG one and MPEG two, and we can go from there to MPEG four. Uh, initially, I didn't I didn't plan to go to all this all the different compression, but I think I think there's enough interest and uh, interest to look at that stuff. So I, I kind of give a brief overview yesterday that one of the so when pe when people talk about this in a technical term they say you know if you want to do spatial uh, spatial compression and temporal compression right essentially if within a picture if you are re removing all kind of duplicates then you're doing spatial because it's within this this one frame or the spatial uh, frame and then temporal means you kind of look at different frames. So when you talk about 30 frames per second, essentially you have 30 different unique pictures uh, within a second, and it keeps going on. So the, the the observation you make is things don't things rarely change. So in, in fact, over here I may be moving, the blackboard doesn't move all that much. This moves slowly, right? This moves, this kind of wobbles slowly. So depending on what what those are, you may be able to get good compression by removing stuff that, that doesn't change. And that, that's that's the that's ultimate goal. And how you go about it entirely depends on how much compute facilities you have. So when you, as you look from MPEG-1, MPEG-2, MPEG-4, essentially, you, as you have more compute power, you can do more complex things. You can look at, at a higher level, and of course, that kills the machines. So it, the, it all started to start off with H.261, which was designed as a video uh, chat client for ISDN networks. And ISDN networks, it's a networking uh, half, they are built in terms of 64 bit chunks. So you can have, you know, you can have 128 kilobits per second or whatever, but essentially it's, it's you get it in uh, increments of 64 kilobits per second. So that's sort of where these things fall, right? And in H.261 started the definition of these different kinds of frames, and they started with the notion of an I frame and a P frame. I frame is the reference frame. It has all the information, right? And it's used spatially encoded. You essentially do something like a JPEG to get the base frame. And P frames are all predicted frames. So you predict what the, so you assume that there's a motion, there's a motion to predict where the object moves. If I'm here, in the next frame, if I moved here, right, you predict that, that there's a translation from previous section to here. So which means that the other side can essentially repair the same thing. You can take the original frame, the high frame, and do this mo movement, right, the, mo the motion vector which figures out what direction, how much I moved. Right? And once you do that, there'll be error term. Things change, and that you send. Right? So to kind of make it concrete, and without actually drawing real pictures, right? So, so assume that this is a tree, assume this is a tree. right? Assume this is a person, right? I don't have any more drawing skills beyond this, right? <laughs> so I don't want to draw like you, you, you've seen those like PBS show. This this used to be this an old person. Uh, Bob Ross. Okay. Who draws by the tops? Yeah. Who would draw really fast? Yeah, you'd be like, oh, you know, just you know, like all you take like is like this ink, and then you do like this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> a tree right here, and then. Yeah, you like, like what he done a few years he ago. He was really cool. Yeah, he died, he died ten years ago. Yeah, I was so sad. It's the one on TV now. Anyway, so you know, so <laughs> that guy likes to X-ray, because you're like, <laughs> you try to do the same thing, and all you see is a big blast. And then like, oh, yeah, and then I don't know. I've got a few paintings that I copied off of his. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so assume this is this is the this is our tree and and a, and a person, right? And, and assume this is the so circle. The person. Yeah. <laughs> and, and assume, just the <laughs> yeah. Assume in the next slide, the the tree didn't move, and the person moved here, right? So, what we want to figure out is which ones moved and which ones did not move, and, and develop the motion vector, right? So we have to essentially figure out what how how do we go about figuring out? You know, do we go about as an object level or what have you? So far, we only have compute power to, to do work in blocks, right? So let's say we define a block which is this big for no reason but to make this 
illustration interesting, right? So we figure out that there's a block here, and we try to figure out where this block went over here, right? So you could start out by assuming that the block would have gone anywhere, so search the whole frame whichever way. Or you can restrict it to say it probably only moved within a certain range, right? So depending on what your assumption is on this period stuff, you can say it wouldn't have probably moved beyond like this range, right? So just search within the same range and try to figure out if this block looks some, some, something similar to something here, right? So you would you'd start out with, say, this range, and you start to look, right? Hopefully, you won't notice that this matches with here, right? That's bad, because obviously this is, these are different objects. So hopefully you're trying to match this with, with the right one, right? And suppose you, you, you did a good job and you matched this, right? Okay. So this object kind of moved here. And the way you do that is sort of look at the statistics of what is inside this, this uh, block and statistics here in terms of color or what have you, right? And it turns out this is the minimum thing you, you would do here, right? So what you you send is, let's say this die frame, right? For the next frame, you would say from here to wherever this one went, right? Let's say this is the, the moment, right? So you would send a vector which is say like that, because it got translated like that over here, right? But if you did that, essentially you would move this one here, which means that the tree would be empty here, the now trunk here. I guess you just move the stuff, right? So the error term you would send is essentially would erase tree <coughs> in block, right? And draw something here, like whatever would be here, right? Draw uh, background. So you would figure out what this would be. And then you would send it off. If it turns out that this, all the data that you have here is more than just sending the block itself, then you send the block. Right? Otherwise, you try to do this stuff. So that's that's the idea. So you, you try to send the, the the motion and the error estimate. If the error happens to be too much, right? Then you you're better off sending a new frame, new block. Yes. So that's how you get um, like you would start with the one i frame, and then when the when the data there is too big. It's going to send another actual frame, so that'll be another iframe. You can send another iframe, or you can send a p frame where this component alone looks like iframe. Right? You can say so. It's, it's doing it in blocks. It's not sending the whole image. If it turns out the whole image was changed, you should send a new iframe. Otherwise, you can say just this component alone. Here's the actual data, so you can kind of patch it. Right? You can kind of say this whole scene. This alone would be rendered. Everything else is predicted, right? And you can do that. So you, if you have a P here and a P here, you can predict from the previous version or, or what have you, right? So essentially, that's that's the idea. So that's that's what it's trying to do, right? One of the nice things or bad things, depending on how you look at it, all these compression algorithms are designed by companies which have a vested interest in making sure that they come out ahead in all these things, right? So they don't want the, their competitors to know how they do this algorithm, right? Because if you're really smart, so if you're kind of dumb and you picked this to be the block, then your picture will be awful, right? Because you're, you're, you're going all, all over the place. So the encoding algorithm is not defined by the standard. All these algorithms only define the decoding part, not the encoding, right? So MPEG and H.261, all those things define that you have this notion of high frame, high frame, P frame, and you have a notion of these error vectors, I mean the motion vectors and the error, error components, but not how you generate them, right? So if you are uh, somebody who's developing the hardware or software, you have complete freedom on how to do this stuff, and that's that's where the difference is in terms of, you know, that's why one picture may look different or better than the other one. One picture may look faster or what have you, right? There is a public domain version of the encoder, part of the VLC project or whatever, but I bet it's not as good as some of the other ones, right? And it's also good because now the hardware, the, the hardware encoders can encode these things, not exactly the same way as you talk about in software, right? And and get better compression, right? And that's that's important to remember that the, the encoding is not a standard. So. 
all the so essentially that's that's the idea behind all the compression we're going to see in, 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 in class today. But they, they all have these magical notions of like how big this block should be and all those things. And it's a trade-off between how you want to send it and how, how big it's feasible for, for the current technology. Right? So uh, H.261 defines the, more, the these blocks to be 16 by 16 pixels. Right? And other standards would, would relax that. But for now, 16 by 16 uh, pixels. So essentially, that leaves us three different ways of searching for for the uh, for the motion vector from, from your book, right? And obviously there, there may be other ones that different companies use to encode these things. So the, the first one is a sequential search. So, so what you do is you let's let's remove this, this line. Which is essentially what, what you, you do, right? You kind of define how far away from the block the, the motion could have been, right? And you define that as the value P, right? And for H261, the, the value of P is 15, which means that this block could have started from here, which is if this is x, y, this is um, x minus P, y minus P, right? Like this, right? 15 pixels around the thing. So you you start from here, try to see it as a match, then move it one, match, move one, now one, 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 move down all the way, and then you do it. And then you do the min, right? The one which has the minimum uh, match is probably the one that you want to choose, right? It's a brute force method. It's a pretty simple method. There's not a whole lot of operations. You know, the, there's a subtraction, absolute value, and a addition, right? But you do that over and over again for all this stuff. And um, for a, you know, for a 720 by 480, the, your DV format image, 30 frames per second, you would need about 30 billion operations per second, right? And that's that's a lot, right? That that's that's probably not feasible for most hardware to be doing, most software to be doing, right? So you have other other ways, other heuristics that you can avoid avoid this stuff. The 2D logarithmic approach sort of does a binary search, right? It again defines this region, and then it chooses this like these uh, these nine points. The corners and the the middle ones, right? And it, it only probes those points. And whichever is the is the uh, minimum, it'll next time it'll move the square centered on that one, right? So if it turns out that this was the minimum, next time, and it also makes the size smaller, right? So you next time you'll look into a nine by nine here, right? Does that make sense? The first one, you, you figure out what's the lowest, and then use that as the midpoint, and look around that stuff. And then you go on like this, and then you hopefully find the find the accurate one. Right? So it won't be as accurate as the first one, but it cuts down the number, number of operations about 30, 25 times some of that. Right? And the, the other one is the hierarchical uh, thing, where you scale the image down to a small size. right? And, and you, you also scale everything. right? So let's say you scale it by 16 times, which means on, on each direction, which means that this block will become a dot, right? So in that small image, you search for matching this dot. And if there's a matching color, then you kind of go to the next level and so on, right? So again, you're, you're trying to optimize. Like, this is where the, all the algorithms come in. Um, but essentially, you're, you're trying to figure out how to come up with the best motion vector. Because the, the closest you can get, the lowest your hopefully your error, error value is, and hopefully you get much better uh, compression. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to ask you to write a MPEG encoder. I think that's the surest way to kill kill anyone, right? <laughs> because it's I don't know. I mean, it's not that hard, but it, it's it 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 will run for a while, right? And um, so the impact coders and other are, are optimized for a long time. So if you try start to do it, taking each frame at a time and trying to do this stuff, um, kind of push your programming skills. Right? Otherwise, your program will be so slow, you can practically like look at three or four frames, right? Um, so again, you know, play trading, you know, the P frames remove temporal redundancy, right? That's a fancy way of saying P frames remove the difference between between frames. 
and the iframes remove spatial uh, redundancy, right? Which is which is a fancy way of saying it compresses the normal way you expect the images to be, right? And the key here is uh, instead of a simple last lossless compression, here here you you, you also mention notice that some things you can't see, you remove them as redundant. Yes. Um, so for this 2D logarithmic search, you say look at the values with the lowest M80. Yeah. So read the book. I mean, M80 is basically the the one which figures out whether these two are similar, right? Whether this and this are similar, right? So the, like it looks at the nine points. No, no, no. So it looks at the whole block, right? So somehow you have to represent this block as a number and this block as a uh, number, okay. and then you compare, right? One way to do that is to average all the pixel values or whatever, right? I think they they have the in the book. Yeah. Um, Back on your previous slide when it said um, math, mm -hmm. did that acronym stand for? <laughs> mean absolute distance. Yeah. What absolute distance? Mean absolute distance. distance. Oh, it's in your book. Sorry. Read the book. How do you read the book? So, so H261 restricts the, the, the P, right? Pixels to uh, 15 pixels. You know how far it can look, right? And and later in, later encodings allow you to look further out. The more you have to look out, the more uh, computation needs to encode, right? So back in the days, 15 was good enough, right? So which has significance because that defines how fast things can go, right? So if you are just throwing a ball in 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 some sport, and depending on where the end camera is and everything, so a particular and encoding may not be able to figure that out at all because it's moving too fast, it's moving past the number of frames, right? And again, like I said, they they all don't specify what the encoder should be. The encoder can be whatever it wants. All you all you when, when, when they say it's MPEG two compliant, it means that a reference MPEG two decoder should be able to decode your object, right? It's a lot more complicated than that. I'll, I'll kind of talk about that as we move along, right? Because it depends on what the what the device can do, right? For example, um, I noticed one of you had a iPod, uh, the video iPod, right? It pays MPEG four, right? It, it pays MPEG four objects, right? But it, that doesn't mean that it plays all MPEG four objects. If you if you look at the specification, it tells you that this machine only has compute power to play a certain number of blocks. I forget the exact number, but it's, I think it's like 388 blocks, right? The blocks we're talking about is this, right? It means that it can only, so you can change the aspect ratio whichever way you want, but you can only operate on that many blocks, right? So that defines a level of what this device can do, right? So it's not, it cannot replay every MPEG-4, you can only replay MPEG-4 up to some kind of stuff, right? So all the MPEG-2 and all the things we're gonna talk about, it's not the general thing. There's, there's caveats, there's all kind of stuff, right? We'll ignore those because those are pretty messy, but but you, you get the idea. You know, it depends on what the hardware can do, right? So the way you send these send the send the H two six one frames is you have a notion of pictures, right? Picture is the is the whole frame, right? And they are time stamped. So you can you can synchronize your audio with the video. We haven't talked about audio at all yet, right? But if you don't synchronize, then you you lose synchronization and your lips will be moving, but you won't hear the sound and stuff. So they have to have a way of synchronizing these two, and they synchronize it on pictures. So every picture has a timestamp. So audio has to play at the right timestamp, or else it'll, it'll go out of sync. So they also define. So, so within a picture, a picture, a picture is defined by uh, GAV, right? It, it's a it's a group of blocks. So essentially, at this picture, you would convert that into a bunch of blocks that you are, you are operating on. Each block is 16 by 16, I mentioned before. So depending on the, whether it's a SIF or the QSIF, right? SIF is the common interchange format, one size or the QSIF, which is one quarter size, you'll have a different number of macro blocks. One is 11 by three macro blocks or whatever. All that means is your picture now has um, 11 here and three, three blocks here that, that you're transmitting, right? And so when the, when the, for each picture, you'll keep sending these 
these blocks in a certain fashion and then keep moving. So if it loses synchronization at some point, you can um, synchronize at the next block. So you'll, you'll miss this one component, and then it'll show up on the next one, right? Variants of this you might have seen when you're watching digital TV. If you watch digital TV, if you notice your analog TV signal is not good, right? It'll become fuzzier and fuzzier equally, right? But if you're watching digital TV, suddenly you see like some patches going through, right? And if you notice closely, it'll be like sort of, it'll, be, it'll always be square, uh, straight boundaries, but kind of elongated, right? If you haven't watched it, if you have any kind of digital source, like your cable or something, you'll notice these kind of patches going through. Right. And essentially, you're losing one of these the set of blobs blah, or blobs, blah, blah, depending on what, what you're talking about. But one, you're losing one of these things. Right. So you may lose the whole whole object, or you may lose these little chunks. Everything else will be clear. The ones you lose are completely black, because you lost synchronization or whatever. Right. And if you lose synchronization, you can wait for the next job. So essentially, this part will be black on that particular frame, and you go on from there. And again, again, these as as the technology improves, this don't have to be the simple, you know, rectangular thing. It can be very good. Okay. So then we look at H two six three. Right, these these standards are developed by uh, IPU, the International something something. Right, the folks in um, Europe. Right, they <coughs> they define these these standards. They define the standards for the telephony. It's international telephony is something, right? Union, I think, right? And they and they define these standards. And um, so H263 followed after MPEG-1, right, in terms of time frame. So they, they took some of the things that they learned from M MPEG, uh, which came from the motion motion um, motion group. I can't remember uh, acronyms anymore today. Right? So since the technology has improved, they, they added Larger images and smaller images. So they added four CIF, right? Which is you know seven or four, five, seven, six, or sixteen CIF. Essentially, it's, it's you know sixteen, which is four by four on each dimension, right? And also sub Q CIF, which is smaller, right? So at, at this point, you can um, take the change, and it does. They also increase the amount of bit rate that these these formats can use after compression. So they, now you can actually have one megabits per second compressed. Right, that that's your target that you are shooting for. Um, so, some of the things that they relaxed are the GAFs can now be variable size. Right, the only restriction is it should start here and it end here. It cannot wrap around, but the GAFs can be different size. Right, the other restriction is all the pictures should be covered because otherwise you will have a blank spot. But the GAFs can be different size depending on. Depending on what what this what the what this, the scene is about, um, but they added one significant. So th there is another part which is the, the motion compensation. So if you're operating on this frame, it uses this frame, this frame, and this frame. It, it uses these three to predict, right? And again, this is probably based on user studies which show how things move in uh, in, in these kind of systems, right? And the other, the other uh, thing that was introduced here was half notion of half pixels, right? The idea here is if you predict that the, it moved from, let's say you look at these two locations, right? You, you think it moved from either here or here, the mat for both these are the same, right? Then you assume that the actual movement was probably in the middle, which you couldn't really know because you're already operating on pixel boundaries, right? So the matter value for these two are the same. That means the the real match should be somewhere in the, in the vicinity. So you can now specify it at half point. Even though you can't see it, even though you can't measure it, you can now say that the real mass, the real movement was somewhere between these two frames, right? Hopefully the, the decoder can use that to get better screen. So if you're change, taking a SIF image and showing it in a fourth SIF, uh, display. This half may actually make it look good, right? But that's one thing that they added, and you'll see them like being carried around in, in the future ones. 
and they define additional modes, right? One of them, the book talks about the number of different modes. One of them is the TB frames. I'll, I'll get to that in the, I think, the next slide, right? TB frame is actually an addition to, so I is the um, intra frame, T is a predicate frame, and B is the bidirectional frame. And since then, there's been H263 plus and plus plus and stuff. So they've, they've been adding stuff here, you know, depending on, on, on what the what the experience has been. So now they, they can do a motion vector up to minus 2 to 6 to plus 2 to 6, no matter the PHP 15. So essentially, they can look at a larger uh, larger size, right? And it may not make sense for their subsurf image, because that's only a 192 or something to begin with. So that's too big, but for larger images, that's how I think makes sense. So, the other thing they added for, with, with the, the newer standards was the notion of a slice. Rather than talk about just these jobs, right? Now you can talk about a, a number of these blobs to form a slice and operate on them as one. And the, and the slices can also be, um, don't have to fall on the same lines, it could be of like this, right? Your slice can be in arbitrary complex form. Um, and the graphs can be different size. You can have a number of graphs add together to form a slice. The slice could be, um, could, could span multiple different rows, right? And again, again, these sort of things seem to make sense. The idea, the, where these all, all pay off is, if you see me move around, right? It may make sense to kind of put me into this one, ideally, right? if you could do it. If you can put me into one slice, right? And this slice can have big props and stuff optimized for just for me. And there may be a small thing move, moving here. Let's say you're having cuckoo block moving here, right? So you can then change the block size for that to be pretty small, because you know, the, the little pendulum is small. And you can define its own set of neighborhood that it should look for, right? So in the same picture, I could be moving around, there could be a small little thing moving around here. We'll both have different notion of motion objects because our, our graphs are different. So that's that's where they are evolving to, right? They would, they would ideally want to evolve is have a model of me sent over, right? And not exactly the square form, but actually say this is a human being with this kind of thing, and they are moving, right? In fact, MPEX 7 and all can actually animate me on the other side. So when I say, I mean, I'm moving my hand, you don't actually have to send these pixel thing, but you can actually say my hand is moving. So you define the model, and it's it's redrawn on the other side, right? Very few players do that, but that's essentially where, where this whole thing is going towards, right? And and doing that requires lots of compute power, and we're slowly getting to that point. So that brings us to MPEG, right? MPEG, MPEG 1. Um, MPEG is the motion picture, some group, right? Experts group. Experts group. Oh, good. Okay, experts. Okay, that sounds good. Um, actually, the, the, I think that's the right one, right? Experts group, right? Motion picture experts group. Motion picture expert group, right? So those folks wanted a way to send videos to um, distribute videos and stuff, right? So essentially, this was generated for. VCDs are video on CDs, right? VCDs are really popular in the, outside the US, you know, in, in Asia and stuff, but essentially you want to store your video on a CD, right? and, and the CD can only store 600 or so mega, mega bytes. So that restricts how much data rate you can, you can save, right? Raw DVD can store for some odd gigabytes. Your CD can store 500 odd megabytes, and your, the, the future, you know, Blu-ray or HD DVD can store 25 or so gigabytes, right? So the more you can store, the more your compression can actually use, right? So for now, since you want to store it on a CD, that restricts how much data you can have. So they define the standard to be 1.5 megabits per second, of which 1.2 goes for video and 256 goes for audio, right? And 256 is a, it's a very good quality. I mean, that's, that's actually CD quality using MPEG-1, right? So if any of you have used 
uh, Apple, iTunes, and stuff, right? Two of the I mean, they use 128 kilobits per second in MP4, and the claim is that's not as good as CD, right? But for now, within within the confines of MP1, that's a CD quality. So you can you get very good quality audio, and you get sort of a okay quality video. Right? This aspect I didn't say that before, but human beings can actually appreciate sound better than video, right? If you, if you can get rid of something, get rid of the video because if this audio quality is good, people assume people have are more happier, right? And that's that's the logic behind it. It's a five-part description, you know, if you look at the thing, there's a system for you, what hardware should do, software should do, how. So it's essentially worried about how to figure out if you are compliant. The main goal is to make all these things interoperate, right? So if you buy a BCD from Sony and play it on your Pioneer video or a player or something, they should all play well. So all the standards are essentially trying to make sure that the descriptions are, are, are solid enough that you know the encoders can develop the right set of descriptions the decoders can, can play them, right? So they introduce the notion of the B frame, which I kind of mentioned before, right? So the idea here is there are some scenes where predicting in the forward direction may not really make sense. What you really want is predicting backwards. So here's one example I think your, your book gives. So if you have a frame and this is Right. This is frame one, two, three, and moving this way, right? So something is coming from off, off screen into the into field, field of view. So if you're trying to predict from here to here, right, you'll do a horrible job because you don't know what is here. So you're trying to match this with this, right? So you, you may at, at best match this way, or you, you you may not or uh, you're, you're doing something poor. But if you look in the future, right, from future to here, this mapping is easier, right? So what you do is, in the, in the B frame, you try to predict both from the next frame and the previous frame on either side. Sometimes you'll be able to predict this stuff better from looking at both, sometimes from the previous, sometimes from the future. So in this particular case, the future would have probably helped you more than this one. And that's the notion of the B frame, right? So now you have a notion of an I frame, a P frame, and a B frame. I frame is the reference frame. P frame is, is forward predicted from the I frame. And B frame is forward, is bidirectional prediction, right? So what this also means is you cannot do anything with a B frame or a P frame, right? By itself, they are useless. They have to have a reference to something. They have to have a B frame or an I frame. So you need to first get an I frame, and then you can do these predictions to move forward, right? And uh, with the with a certain ratio of I frame and B frame and B frame, you can get good compression, right? I think the the book talks book talks about um, one example of how, how how big these things look, right? Uh, I frame 18 kilobyte for some video. The P frame is 6 kilobyte and a B frame is 2.5 kilobyte. It's smaller and smaller, right? The other thing you do is B frame is much less fidelity than the I frame. You want the I frame to be very good quality. But these ones, you're sort of okay, right? Because there's, there's, there's slight, slight off here. Yeah. So if, if the object went from here to here, right? But if you kind of predict it to be sort of here, you, you most of the time you're okay. So how many of you know how the actual movie, the, 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 the film thing works? How many of you actually looked at how horrible the thing is if you, if you think about it? Right. Essentially, it's doing 24 frames per second, right? So it, it moves this frame in front of the light, projects something off, right? And then it's the next, next part, right? You're not, you're not seeing the half frame, you're seeing the front frame. There's some mechanical thing which is kind of making these things happen, right? They're not very smooth, right? They're not as smooth as you want. And the frame, the, the film is moving through really fast, right? You probably see the, the film kind of thing, right? And the film is not like a straight, perfect thing, right? It's kind of full thought and it's, it's going through, but it's kind of waving this way, this way, right? It's, it's, so let's assume the frame is like going from a spool here and going to another spool here. It's not going perfectly straight line all the time. 
it's kind of wobbling a little bit, right? If it wobbles, that means the focus is kind of moving back and forth, right? So when you're watching the movie, you're watching some picture which is shown every 24 times, which is out of focus back and forth, right? It's, it's going this way, this way, a lot, right? People love that because it's called cinematic feel, right? But people rarely complain about this thing being going off and on, right? In fact, one of the, the, the some of the people who saw the, the digital uh, projector, right? How many of you have seen a digital projector? Uh, Star Wars was like making a big deal out of it, right? Because Lucas wanted everything to be in digital, so I think like last, the, the second and third edition was only on digital, and, and they showed only on digital in some uh, main theaters, right? So how many you saw it? I saw, well? yeah, actually I saw third Matrix movie. Okay. So digital projector will not have that effect, right? By default, it's it's not being, there's no physical motion. So some of the people who saw the pictures think it's cold looking, right? Because the picture looks static, right? Um, so they have to add this in. So you know, software effects to make it look go out of focus once in a while, right? <laughs> you can notice it, right? If you're kind of bored of the movie or something, and if your theater is, if, if they're showing something, like if you go to some bad data, right, you may see like an exit sign kind of like sticking there. That's the reference, right, because exit sign rarely moves with the picture. So if you look at this stuff and you look at the, the thing, right, and if there's a static scene, you'll see the thing going back and forth, the image going, you, you know what I'm talking about? If you, if you take a static thing like this and you see the picture going, it's wobbling back and forth and this way, this way, and focusing in and out, right? But our, our mind averages everything out and it looks perfect, right? So if it's going to do that, why bother, right? So that's why the B frames, when they when they send the B frame, it's not exactly predicted where it should be, but it's in general vicinity and that's good enough and you get better compression, right? What you really like is uncompressed video at full frame rate and stuff, right? Unfortunately, we can't deal with those. Right? Unfortunately, a full video with no artifacts like this it's just not feasible, right? Because the bit rates required and the and the transmission required, it's just not possible, right? I think I think if we, we look at it before, right? 1920 by 1080 um, picture times 24 bits per per pixel times 30 frames, right? Whatever this is, you, you need that much bits per second, right? You can't store that much, you can't transmit that much. So we have to play these these elements. Right. So, so you, you essentially have this notion of I, I, P, B, whatever. You decide what you're going to send up front and that's sent in the header. The header decides what order these things should be sent, and that's how your your picture your pictures are, are sent, right? So it it, it depends it differs from object to object. But the object, the, the file header should say what order you're going to see, right? What, what is the basis for you to choose how many I's and P's and B's and what order you would want? Can you think of uh, what, how many does it guess? Well, some of it might depend on how active your scenes are. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the classroom, where it's you will be back and forth occasionally, mm -hmm. the overhead changing there isn't a lot of action to catch. Mm -hmm. But if it was a car chase <coughs> in a movie, mm -hmm. then you might need uh, original frames. It, it's based on the file. It's not based on the scene, right? So you have to decide based on what type of movie it is. Like a action movie or different. Yeah, like, you just need to set the quality of the grade for the encoding and it's based on how big of a file you want. Can you, is there a coding out there that does um, variations throughout scenes that you can notice that? There's a you know, kind of stagnant scene that it uses more P and B frames. No, not, not, not. I don't think F4 does, but um, I'm not sure if F4 does, but no. I, for now, I don't think you can you know, they do that. Right? The, the, the problem is you have to worry about the poor encoder, not just the, de the, sorry, the decoder. Right? The, the way technology works, when they define this, this standard, right? The encoders and decoders can do just 
can only deal with these things not changing, right? But encoders get getting better and better and better, right? Because the technology keeps improving, the processes get faster, they can do more stuff, but the decoders cannot change because decoders are usually stuck in hardware, right? So I don't think they can do that yet. Are they looking into that? Is that a current research? They'll probably they they may do that in MPEG twenty one. I don't know much about MPEG twenty one because MPEG twenty one can do everything, right? So <laughs> they must be able to do that, right? <laughs> Because if you want to change it on the way, you need to have headers into the image saying which, which is switching, right? So that complicates stuff, right? So what is the reason why you would want to have like the inter intra frame distance to be large, right? Let's assume the I to I, right? And let's call it K, right? Why would you want K to be higher? Yes. Because you're compressing better. I mean, the, the P and B frames are much smaller. Mm -hmm. So the more of those you can have, the less I frames, mm -hmm. the better compression ratio you're getting. And give me a reason why you would want this K to be smaller, I mean, to be small. You'd get better quality. Because your I frames tend to be um, higher quality than the P and B frames. Is that true? Would you get better quality if you have more I frames? Unconditionally. The scene never changes and your quality wouldn't be any different. Yeah, it depends on the scene, yeah. right? Rather than the number of stuff. If the scene never changes if you are if I move away, right? All you're watching is this, right? You can essentially have one eye frame and then all B or B frame which basically says nothing changed, right? I can have any number of eye frames, things don't change. Yeah, so the, the, the you depends on the on the particular movie or particular case that you're looking at, right? If it changes a lot, that's, that's one of the things you pointed out, right? Then you may want to adapt these things, but that has other, other challenges, right? You come up with some number that you use, right? What's the other reason why you would want more iframes, or less iframes? And this has got to do with the networking, right? Yes. Because it's synchronization. Maybe in the iframes, like draw your synchronization. So. Yes, yeah, so you can you can you can possibly have a synchronization going with iframes, right? Another reason. Yes. Less data to send though. Yes, what? Less data to send. So aren't the iframes rather big? You don't have to send them way across. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying other way. I'm saying oh. why would you want the iframes to be shorter? Oh. Or closer together. The answer was when I was talking about here. Right? Which is without the iframe, P and B are useless. Right? So if you're take, talking about wireless networking or what whatever, if you lose this, all this is useless. Right? Because I can't predict anything without the base layer, right? So if I'm transmitting it over wireless or whatever, I even if the scenes don't change, I can't set it for like too I can't make this too long because then you'll have a big black spot where, where you didn't get anything at all, right? So you want this to be smaller when you're, if you're doing transmission, or if you're doing any, so it, let's take it as a CD, right? The CD, there's a little mark, and it couldn't read some frames, right? If I could read an iframe, if the thing is too long, then essentially you see black, right? So you want to balance that too. So you want to balance with how much action there is on the scene. You want to balance with how much, uh, how, you want to balance with like what happens if these things fall out, right? The other thing is you want to balance with your buffering too, right? All the things we are talking about that like, you can predict from back and forth, right? So you, this B can be predicted from here to here, and, and so on and so forth, right? Which means that you need to have some kind of a big buffer which keeps all the stuff, right? A frame which is a B frame which is here may differ on this I frame, right? It's perfectly allowed to do that. Which means that you need to be able to store this set of sequences in your memory, um, which may or may not be a problem depending on what type of device you have. It may not be a problem for your laptop, it may be a problem for your cell phone, right? So the longer you have, the more buffering requirements you add up, right? So you, you don't want to go too long, but it's again uh, an art, right? So if you if you did, if you, if you use iMovie or what, what have you, right? It'll, it'll ask you when you want the iframes, right? It, it can, it may call it different terms, but how many frames do you want it before things happen, right? Um, 
Actually, I may be wrong. The, I think MPEG-4, I actually don't know the MPEG-4 details, but I think MPEG-4 may allow you to change the, the width. Um, I'll, 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 I'll confirm tomorrow. Right? So essentially, this was made to uh, support a, they call it a SIF format, which is for the, what, what the NTSC does. It's a 352 by 240, which is a different, slightly different size than the CIF format. Right. And again, this comes from different groups. You know, that's from the teleconferencing side. This is from the TV side. Um, so they have a notion of, of slices, again, which are variable length. And I don't think it, it's, um, it, it has to be on, on the same row. I don't think it can be in different rows. Right? Because this one happened before H.263. And again, you can do sub-pixel motion compensation if you if you can't know exactly where the object is. You kind of say it should be in the middle, right? And all these things. So the other thing you want to do if you're if you're doing a CD and all is to be able to do random access, right? You want to fast forward or go to a random spot and then start playing, right? If you want to do that, you have to you have to go back to the um, iframe and go from there, right? You cannot random access to this point. Because you have to go to the iframe, start from there, and then predict your way to where you have to be, right? So there can be a slight delay between these things happen. So that introduces the notion of group of pictures, right? GOP is, is, is what the people like to call it. But essentially, GOP says that that's the, that's the set of like iframe chunks that you keep repeating, right? And you would go back to the beginning of the cup to start random access always to start of the cup, right? That there is a sequence of type EP that you are you're sending. That's called a group of pictures, right? That notion started from from impact one kind of thing. Um, and the, the in a cup the first frame is always the iframe. Right? So you can always access you can always jump to a cup and go from there. So next we look at MPEG-2, and I'm going to stop with that. We can end with the H.264, MPEG-4 in the next class, right? MPEG-2 followed after H.263, right? And that's the, um, so when they generated MPEG-1, I believe, in 89, 90 time frame, and then MPEG-2 in 93 time frame, they thought they will need MPEG-3 for um, high-definition high TV. And then MPEG 4 and so on, right? But halfway through, they realized that they don't need an MPEG 3 because MPEG 2 itself could support high definition, right? So they kind of wrapped that up. So there's no MPEG 3 because they thought they may need it, but they didn't need to. So MPEG 4 is a fresh start. So there's MPEG 1, MPEG 2, and then MPEG 4. There's no MPEG 3. Um, so this one can support. Ba you know, data rates higher than, than 4 megabits per second, right? In fact, if you look at, so they define different profiles. Different profiles, if you if you dig into your video editing program, there'll be different profiles. You know, you'll call it base profile or more additional profile. And that defines what sort of image, what's the image size, and what's the data rates, and all those things, right? So assume that one of the profiles define DVD, right? One of the profile defines HDTV. One of the profile defines sort of what will go into your iPod, you know, in terms of the computer facility and all those things, right? Um, so your, most of your normal things that you see right now are encoded in MPEG-2, right? your DVD, your HD TV, and both of the, the, the HD DVD format, HD DVD and the Blu-ray, use MPEG-2 as the base, right? It's kind of unfortunate because MPEG-2 does not give you as much compression. But there's enough hardware out there that is cheaper, right? So your setup box that you have at your home to watch cable or, or, or whatever, they, they're doing MPEG-2 in hardware, right? If you buy a TV tuner card for your PC, it has a built-in uh, MPEG-2 um, decoder. Um, and it, it also supports interleaved fields, right? So remember, like, so far, we, we didn't talk about interleaved format, but the, the TV is doing interleaved format. So what that means is if you take this 
you know, remember the you interleave it like this, right? And if you take it into two different parts, the first one, let's say, has these, and the second one has these, right? So essentially, the the first field would be three lines like this, and the second would be three lines like this, you know, the interleave format. Right? So MPEG2 knows about this, I mean, it does the compression, right? It predicts on the field, not necessarily the frame, because that's, that's how it's transmitted, right? The, the book goes into more details on that one. I'm not sure if it's that important to know how exactly it does, but there's an idea to try to, again, figure out uh, this motion, uh, motion artifact, right? Let's get back to here before we go, go back up here. It, it, now it supports profiles which, which can do uh, 422 chroma subsampling or 444, right? 444 essentially means that none of the components are, are subsampled at all. 422 is, is more than what the base one is 420, right? So you get more color values, obviously higher bandwidth requirements, right? So in terms of DVD, right? DVDs can be encoded up to 10 megabits per second, right? So if you were to burn a DVD right, as part of your project or, or whatever, you can set your DVD to burn up to 10 megabits per second, right? You can either set it to do variable bitrate or constant bitrate. I think the minimum is 4 megabits per second or something, right? So at the encoder, you can say what you want. So you can create, take a scene, encode it using 4 megabits per second or, or 10 megabits per second, It'll still be DVD, right? You, you'll be able to store less on a DVD disk than using one by the other. One will look better than the other one, right? So, but the but the catch is, if you send it at 10 megabits per second signal, which DVD hard to support, many of your players may or may not support it. So if you buy the $34 Walmart DVD player, <laughs> it may not be able to support the data rate that 10 megabits per second DVD player would require because if you're getting that much data rate, then you can the I frames and B frames and P frames can be more. Um, so you have a lot more leverage in what you can do, right? So you may not be able to play, so you may see blocky effect, right? How many of you have noticed it in any form? So if you, like if you have like a DVD player, some DVD players may actually let you see what the data rate is you're you are, you are seeing, right? And try to. If your DVD player does that, look look at those to see what your movie is doing, right? And most of the movies are recorded in DVR, so you can see that if there's no action at all, it'll go down to like four or five, right? And then you see like Star Wars with like some massive scene, it's like 9.6 or 9.8 or whatever, right? So it can it can change depending on um, the different profiles what you try to do. This is one of the most important parts for systems aspect. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a very little space for that here, right? The idea here is if everything is, is fine, if I'm doing for a DVD, right? I'm, 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 it's coming from the DVD player onto, onto, onto my screen. But if I'm sending it across the network and stuff, right? I would like these things to be scalable, right? What I mean by scalable is I would like to say if you only have so much resources, you'll get something which is not maybe as good as the other one, but you'll get something, right? And then I want to add more to it, right? And these are called layered encoding, and these are used extensively in a lot of the research projects trying to get something, right? So to give you a sense, like the, the first one is the SNR scalability, right? SNR is a signal to noise ratio. So scalable meaning like you get more bits, I'll, I'll give you better SNR, right? Which means I give you better signal compared to the noise, right? So depending on how much bandwidth you get, you get better signal to noise ratio than if you have less bandwidth, right? So any facility which can do that could send the base layer or the DC layer, I think I've mentioned it previously. Base layer or the DC layer essentially is the sort of the average color for the, for the, whole, for the whole area, right? So your picture will look clearer and clearer if you have more signal, right? And you may actually notice it if you're very careful in watching your cable TV, right? Some channels will look crisper than the other ones, even though they're all the same, depending on how much things you get. There are other effects playing into the thing, but so I can't really exactly say that's exactly what is happening, right? The spatial scalability would, would allow you to change the picture size. If you don't have enough bandwidth, 
I'm sending the same video to you, right? If you, if if I if I can do spatial scalability, then if you only have, if you're watching it through your laptop wireless, right? Then you get a small screen, right? And if you get wired network, then you get a larger screen. So it's the same transmission being transmitted in a certain, certain format, such that if you lose something in the middle, you'll you'll still be able to get to the screen, right? It's not like the 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 P P kind of stuff where if you don't get this, you don't get anything at all, right? You don't get that information at all. Here you get some of it, right? The other other notion is the temporal scalability, right? Which means that if you if you have more bandwidth, then if you use that kind of mechanism, then your frame rate goes up, right? So the picture looks more smoother than they are. And there are hybrid approaches and all these things. Systems people love this, right? This essentially gives us a way to change the stuff, because all that means is, now I can encode this video to high quality, right? If I can do it in a scalable fashion, then I can encode it in one scalable fashion, and if you are watching it from, say, your cell phone or, or, or laptop, right? Then I can do one of these scalability and, and send you only the layers that affect you, right? Even though I have all the layers, I can either broadcast all the layers, you only pick out the layers that matter to you, right? Or I can send you only the layers that I want because I know what you have, right? So I can I can do these things to get you better quality. If I'm building a peer-to-peer -peer system, I can use this to say, I send this layer through one way, I send this layer through another way, so maybe you'll get all of them. I can do another thing, I can send the lower layers, I can send it with more redundancy, right, and the, and the higher layers. Network is very uh, um, noisy. Then I can send the lower layers maybe twice, and the higher layers less frequently, so that you'll get some quality even though the network is is strong. Right. So the layer encoding is is a bread and butter for a whole bunch of people. Right. But the essential idea there is you can you can kind of change it on the fly based on what you have sent. Right? Yeah, and it, it also allows not nonlinear quantization for the, the JPEG component of the of the picture, right? So hopefully at this point you kind of get a sense of where it, it all came, right? So you may if the, the videos and all are, are not as nice as you would like them to be, right? And I will tell you in a minute what, what I mean by that. And you have all these artifacts where you kind of use the notion of what you can see, what you can't see, which is which is fundamentally what's driving this, right? So you still want it to look good. So you want your video to look good on a VCD, your DVD, or HDVD, or what have you. And you do that to a large extent. I mean, you, you get nowhere close to this bandwidth, and you can still get pictures which look really awesome, right? What this means at this point is, if you think about it, right, network folks or systems folks hate this kind of a stuff, right? They would like something what they call CBR, right? If you talk to the networking folks, there's a notion of CBR and BBR. CBR means constant bitrate, BBR means variable bitrate, right? In a constant bitrate, I would like to say, I need this much bitrate, right? Where every 130th of a second, I need this much bitrate, right? It's, I, I need the constant bitrate, which is which is kind of easy to conceptualize. I, I, I get this constant barrage of bits, I can do real-time systems based on that. I can say I need like 10 milliseconds of computation because I know how much data I'm going to get. I'm going to get that all the time, right? And if I'm doing energy conservation, I can say I need to sleep for this much time because that's what I'm going to do. If I need storage, I can say I need. You get that drift, right? I know I, I can predict all this stuff. Life is good and everything, right? But these systems are, don't do any of those, right? So imagine how this file will be stored or being transmitted, right? Your iframe would be something, your P frame will be something, your B frame will be something. So what would that mean on the network, right? You see this variation, right? You see suddenly like a lot of requests and then nothing. You see not nothing, nothing, not nothing. So in terms of real-time scheduling, even though you would love the world to be seen, a lot of papers do publish, if you look at the papers, in, in, in the real-time or other communities, right? You'll, you'll say, let's assume a CPR uh, traffic, right? It's easy to think about, right? But if you're doing real-time scheduling on, on these streams, right, then your resource requirements change quite drastically with all this stuff, with, with each frame, right? How many of you, like, 
like seen like real time paper talk about have this little like they'll say lines and they'll say like you know this 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 is for video decoding and this is for then I'm gonna do something here and like you do kind of scheduling, right? Take real time course, they have like to have this little square and optimize something, right? Right. No, I don't I don't, I don't mean to despise them because the thing is reality is is I don't want to say the word, but it's very hard, right? So what you really would see, which which is one of the reasons why it's, it's very hard to deal with, is you may see that the processing needed for the first iframe may be this, and then you may need like like this, right? It's hard enough to worry about like this abstracted CS format without having to worry about this unpredictable thing. It also depends on the model, right? So it depends on if I'm jumping around, then you see lot more data, then it does nothing, right? So your your scheduling and all things depend. So if you want to develop a scheduling algorithm which depends on the scene, if you want to develop a data transmission algorithm which depends on the scene, energy scans, and all the things up on the scene, right? I don't know how to do that, right? And that's one of the reasons why I don't want to go into this stuff, but that's that's the stuff, right? And when you go to conferences and stuff, people are slowly kind of getting sick of the CBR kind of stuff. It's easy, you know, it's, it's kind of stuff, yes. But we haven't done that since MPEG, too. We haven't done that for the last, last 10 or 15 years, right? No commercial anything would do CBR, right? So you would have to look at these things. So a lot of the systems aspect of this, which what we were leading up to this very slowly over four lectures was, this is the what, what you're going to see. Uh, you see, see this I frame, P frame, B frame, what have you. And we are trying to do these network, networks or systems or whatever. you got to figure out how to manage these things. All of which still have the same real time requirements. All of them still want it to be 30 frames per second, but the resource requirements changes wildly. right? And one of the things that they, I, I know they're doing that by mistake, people would say is, if when I want to scale something, let me drop all the P frames or B frames, right? And that's, that's irritating because P frames and B frames dropping that would do nothing for your story, for thing. If you want scalability, you want one of these scalability, right? You need to talk about the real scalability, not dropping the P frames, right? I've seen one paper where they said we'll drop the I frames, right? Like, nope. <laughs> that, you might as well stop the video, right? There's no point in sending you a P frame or B frame if I don't send you I frame. If I frame, if I know I frame is stuff, I may as well not send you for till the next I frame. Right? So those sort of things. Right? That's, that's my rant going to be the PC meetings where you see somebody saying, oh, we'll assume CBR. Yeah. They're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so ho hopefully you get a more appreciation of what does involve, what these, these, these things are putting your machines through in terms of the computation and, and stuff like that, and why we have so much work to do to make our systems work for these kind of systems. <coughs> system. So, a little early. So, how many of you have done with your uh, started your course, the projects and how all this going? Done. Yes, done. Started. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> The, the project is easy. If you think about it, there's nothing there, right? But I want you to look through all this your, your software to see what, what you're seeing. So you can change the back like, size, you can change these things, right? If you go to the experts that you can change those stuff. Try to see what that does and try to see how your the file sizes change and, and what have you, right? Um, if you, if you, you can't appreciate what you have to do unless you kind of see what, what, what they're doing. So, no, 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 I just, I did it this morning before I left, because I had a camera and I was just going to capture something here. <laughs>